Hello and thank you. I am curious about two things when it comes to salt, um, one of which is potassium. How much potassium are we allowed to intake to counter some of the negative effects of salt or sodium? Um, is it considered in the FDA uh, percentage uh, guidelines or recommendations that you see on the packaging? Now that I see that they say potassium, 20% in this product, what have you. The other thing I was curious about when it comes to salt is I've seen products, and I'm just mentioning one, um, Morton's Light Salt, and I'm wondering, do the same guidelines uh, or well, does the same guidelines for, say, like 1,500 milligrams um, of sodium, does it apply to that? Um, is it recommended or not? You know, or is it something similar to how some artificial sweeteners may still have a negative effect on the body? Thank you. Um, hi, good morning. It's a really interesting debate. Um, but one thing that I was really curious about is that you only seem to be, or the studies that you're citing, from what I can tell, only seem to talk about hypertension. And just sort of randomly, one of the things that I thought about, I know that when I eat a lot of salt, I feel completely different. I can tell right away. Um, I wonder if anyone has ever analyzed things such as children with ADHD and the increasing, you know, we talked about uh, hard foods, the fact that those kinds of foods in the last 30 or 40 or 50 years have been you know, increasingly, the amount of salt that I think we intake is just, is just enormous. So I wonder if there are other studies, because I think just to look at hypertension is one thing. And also, again, if, you know, there are different populations that have different kinds of diseases. So I was just curious if people have looked at other kinds of diseases relative to salt and studied them. Any more up there? So you want to answer these two questions? I believe Dr. Farley is better qualified to answer these questions <laughs> than I am. Uh, be happy to. The, the um, potassium has been studied less than sodium has been studied, but to the, the extent it's been studied, it does look like we should be consuming an awful lot more potassium than we are right now. Uh, that right now we, I, I forget the exact amount, but we're taking in a lot more sodium than potassium, and it should be just the reverse. Um, and, uh, but again, there's less, there's less science behind that than the sodium, which is why the recommendations are, are just about sodium uh, by the bodies in general. The um, one way to have more potassium is to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables. They tend to be uh, have, rich in potassium. Uh, Morton's light salt, by the way, is 50% sodium chloride, 50% potassium chloride. Uh, and, uh, and it's something which Many people find potassium chloride has a metallic taste uh, or a bitter taste. I don't. I've tried the Morton's Light Salt, and it actually tastes fine to me. Uh, and that's probably a closer mix than, uh, than to what we should be eating than uh, regular salt. As far as your second question, I don't know anything about the literature, uh, or if there is any literature, on uh, sodium of ha having an effect on ADHD or other uh, behavioral effects. Um, you know, so it's an open question. Let me can, can I just add to this, and uh, can correct me if I'm wrong on the facts. Um, not infrequently in the salt discussion, um, this boils down to how much salt you're adding to your own food. And uh, the, was it the Boston market chain? They made a big splash by removing the salt shakers from their table. But my read of literature is the amount of so so sodium in our diet that we add ourselves is like 5 10%. That, so, so this debate is really not about how much salt you're adding in your shaker. This is ultimately it's about a structural change to salt in, the f in food processing. Am I Absolutely right. Yeah, it's about 5% of the sodium yeah, you take in is from the salt shaker. And so that's, that's really negligible. And actually, some uh, dietitians recommend that uh, you give people salt in a shaker at the table because... They're going to reduce their uh, processed food. Right. If, if you put less yeah. in the processed food in the first place uh, and then allow people to put some in the salt right. shaker, they won't add that much. They'll get that nice little salt... Uh, zing on their tongue, and they'll end up consuming less sodium at the same time. So, so just, let me just, just comment on this. Um, it's a, th this is um, part of the point I was making about opportunity cost of these kind of discussions, is that it is almost inevitable when a powerful, respected institution like the New York Department of Health engages in a discussion like this about salt, if the commissioner understands that really a meaningful salt reduction is going to have to be a structural change in how food is processed, it comes down to general population and you start this large debate about something which is broadly trivial about how much salt one is shaking with their wrist on, on, on their plates, which then introduces us into the arenas of overreach by federal authority, by paternalism, public health, etc. So this, is, this goes to the heart of my concern about us being judicious about the arenas in which we engage 
if there is doubt that tips it in the, in the direction of maybe this works, maybe this doesn't, given the other things that we could engage. But, but I have a few things to say there that I think have to do with how we frame these issues. And uh, I mean, I would take exception to the quote from Pickering that you had up there, that this is about pursuit of happiness. I think that frame assumes that what the policy proposal is, ban salt, you know, get rid of all the salt shakers. But no, that's not the policy recommendation. And the food industry very deliberately frames things so that it's as if we're taking things away from them. And I would also challenge the notion that public health is about paternalism. And, you know, we were talking before the session started, the more accurate notion, I know you and uh, Mayor Bloomberg were accused of being nanny status, but the, the real nannies are McDonald's and Frito-Lay, who are, without any vote that I know about, you know, putting these huge amounts of salt. And if we uh, accept that charge, that it's the state that is interfering, rather than the food industry deciding to make products hyperpalatable, to appeal to our evolutionary vulnerabilities, then it's a very di different discussion we're having. And I think we as public health folks have an opportunity, have a, an obligation to challenge those frames that we're imposing rather than we're trying to protect people from the imposition that the food industry or the tobacco industry or the alcohol industry is uh, imposing on us in order to make a profit. I, I wonder if either yeah, of you have thoughts let me, about let me, that. Let me comment. I, um, I agree 100% with what Dr. Freudenberg said, and I disagree 100% with it as well. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, uh, Dr. Freudenberg is, uh, is, uh, espouses uh, optimism as an act of political resistance, and I admire that deeply. Um, uh, but um, I, I actually think that's exactly what we should be doing, but I think that's far from where we are. Um, to, to, to go to an issue on which uh, Dr. Farley and I are very much on the same side, which is the issue of regulating 16-ounce sodas. Um, that is an issue which I, to this day, think was exactly the right move um, for many, many reasons, including the potential benefits, and for which the health department got trounced in the public, pr in, in, in the press. Um, the lesson I learned from that is not that it was the wrong move, but that we, if I may use the word, word we, lost in the court of public opinion because we were nowhere near as good at articulating the frame that was guiding our actions. So. I actually, this is why I said I agree completely with Dr. Freudenberg. I, I, I think in an ideal world, an optimistic ideal world, the frames would be different, in which case I would actually feel quite differently about this issue. But I don't think we are there. I think, you know, we're in this room and there's a, this quote right in front of us, which uh, I don't know if you're all seeing, but it's about um, the, the, uh, the world is founded on four essential freedoms. And this country is predicated on essential notions of rights and liberties, none of which include health. So there is an uphill struggle for health. And that is not how it should be, that is how it is. But as a result, it makes the job of those who see their mission and their purpose in life to promote the health of populations um, harder, and we need to be much more careful about how we approach it. And with that in mind, we need to be, be careful about the battles we fight. Uh, I, I agree that, um, first of all, that the 16 ounce cap was the right thing to do and that we lost the PR battle. <laughs> uh, and, and there was a lesson in there for us on, on how to do the PR. Um, but I also do think that uh, you are absolutely right in the way that we frame this, that it, it, the opposition always tends to frame this as we are interfering with individual choices when in fact we're not. What we are doing is trying to protect people from uh, environmental risks of all sorts. Um, and among, un unfortunately, among the more common risks these days are environmental risks that are uh, sold by corporations. Uh, and so I think that's what we're doing with the, uh, the 16 ounce portion cap. We're protecting people by, from some very insidious but effective marketing around sodas. Um, and I think that's what we're doing here is that salt is something be because we have this biologic craving for it, the so food industry has learned that they can dump in huge amounts of it and that means we'll eat more. Uh, and so we're trying to protect people from that practice.